The Unshackled Waves, episode 118. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Given the success of our single issue in focus show on Victoria's African youth gang crime wave, I thought it would be good to do a show focusing solely on the recent political developments in the United States. The mainstream media now believe that this time they have finally found the story that will trigger President Trump's downfall. This was the release of the book Fire and Fury by Michael Wolff, which basically provides a summary of all the criticism that has been made of the Trump administration over the past year. The book has already brought down one person, and that is former White House Chief Strategist Steve Bannon, who resigned as Executive Chairman from Breitbart News, who provided much of the material of the book. On the other side of the political spectrum, celebrities at the Golden Globe Globes wore black to so solidarity with the Me Too movement, which also speech featured a stirring speech from Oprah Winfrey, who accepted a Lifetime Achievement Award, which has resulted in speculation she will run for president. To analyse these events, we are joined by the new deputy editor of The Unshackled and host of Front and Centre podcast, Emilio Garcia. Emilio, welcome back to the show. Oh, Tim, thank you so much for having me back. Now, you've been in Mexico for the uh, past month. What's it been like over there? Oh, you know, it's, it's uh, been really good, a lot more stable than people thought it would be. I thought that I was going to come here to a lot of instability economically and uh, maybe some violence, but it has actually turned out to be, uh, to be you know, very safe and very stable. So I guess maybe we, uh, we have to stop building that wall now, but we'll leave that up to, to the future. But yeah, it's been wonderful and it's been uh, nice and sunny. Now, even though you've been in Mexico, because it is next to the United States, you've been sort of our US correspondent for the past month, uh, uh, keeping up in the uh, nighttime hours over in Australia with uh, US content. That is correct, yeah. I I, I tend to keep up mostly on the US content just because... uh, that that's really where my political interest began in the first place, and uh, also I'm you know half American, so I tend to keep up. But yes, I have taken on that uh, responsibility since I've been here. Now, obviously, there's been quite a number of uh, interesting political developments over in the, the United States. The the big one uh, was, of course, the uh, the the new book uh, Fire and Fury by uh, journalist uh, Michael Wolff, which uh, goes inside the uh, Trump. Uh, White House, and uh, even though the the media has been on um, you know, Trump's case ever 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 since he was inaugurated, there's all, been all these you know talks about oh right. you know he could be impeached at any time, but uh, somehow they think that you know this is <laughs> what's going to bring down Trump. Now uh, they've been talking about impeachment, but now it's uh, invoking the Twenty Fifth Amendment, saying that you know Trump is mentally unsound. <laughs> Uh, I mean that. I mean, first of all, the whole thing about impeachment—it has to die down. Uh, Trump may be impeached. We really don't know. Uh, you know, it's it's not uh, completely off the wall. But to say that it's something that's impending, that's going to happen within the next few days, is absolutely ridiculous. Another thing to take into consideration is that they're saying, oh well, instead of impeachment, then the Twenty Fifth Amendment will take him out. The Twenty Fifth Amendment is far more rigid than the imp- impeachment proceedings. You need way more. Um, you, may, you need way uh, a larger proportion of the Congress and the House to get the president out under the 25th Amendment. So, I mean, what they're saying, they're, they're actually just spouting at this point. It seems like they're just kind of spitballing to see how it is they can get rid of Trump, who is such a politi- uh, you know, politically hated uh, figure on the left. And I will tell you, as a person who, as you know, is no fan of Donald Trump, I'm not covering my eyes and deciding to think that, you know, day after tomorrow, he's going to be out of office, and especially not because of an incredibly inaccurate book. And it seems to be that the media thinks because, you know, all of their, you know, allegations about, you know, Trump's, you know, that he's got a childlike, you know, personality, you know, is, you know, prone to, you know, losing his temper easily. They seem to think that, you know, because it's in book form now, that that seems to have some more legitimacy. Well, I mean, one of the things that I think is that Trump gave it a level of legitimacy that it would have never garnered on its own. 
uh, I mean, if Trump had just, you know, you know, he always punches back, he really can't help himself. But the legal action that he was going to take supposedly against the publisher just made it seem so much more enormous than it actually is. That it made, it made it seem like something important. It made it seem like it was, this was something that Trump wanted to keep under the rug, something that you know, was gonna bring him down or something like that. So honestly, the reason that it had some legitimacy was because Trump uh, decided to go out there and threaten to sue the publisher and the author. Uh, but once you actually get to the book and you read it, and uh, you know, obviously uh, th there are some things that maybe the, the, the common person reading through it won't notice, but many people who are in the actual uh, political circle will tell you that it is riddled with inaccuracies and that most of the book is actually sort of open secrets, badly kept secrets about the inefficiencies of the White House and how Trump, you know, is kind of a, a, an immature figure. But honestly, the, the hype is all to do about nothing. Yeah, and it uh, starts off by saying that, you know, he didn't really want to win and the people around him, you know, weren't uh, ex expecting to win. So they talk about, you know, it was the, the accident of presidency and so they went in you, with, with, you know, not an idea of, you know, what uh, what they did. And then it, you know, go, it goes into, you know, that, uh, you know, he focuses all his attention, you know, on the on the media that he's, you know, clueless about, you know, anything political. It, it, it really, you know, uh, uh, you know, savages him, which, uh, like we said before, you know, is it, it, is nothing nothing new. But you know, it it re it's it's the first account of you know everything, and uh, and and like you said, the reason why it has legitimacy because you know Trump, one of his you know biggest weakness is that you know he can't help but you know uh, you know fight back against you know Straight somebody back. who who, who criticises yeah. him, and so and that you know just feeds into the media saying, oh, see, look at how. You know, uh, immature he, he is. When in fact, you know, the 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 book itself, like it's it's all based on hearsay. Uh, you know, it interviews a whole bunch of people with you know an axe to grind uh, against him. So there's you know, it, it's just publishing you know what they say without you know fact checking uh, any of it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, uh, Steve Bannon, who is obviously the guy who was at the center of this and who put most of, uh, most of the content in there, really did dig his own grave. I mean, uh, you know, this guy has been thought of as this like amazing strategic political thinker. And it seems to me that this guy, you know, this guy who has, who kind of credits himself with the Trump victory, would know better than to put his whole political reputation in the hands of this guy who has a sketchy past and that you wouldn't even take the time to see if the book is accurate that you wouldn't even take the time to see if the sources are good, if people aren't gonna walk back what they said, to at least make sure that the people that he's citing are in the positions that he says they are. He, I think he said that the Secretary of Commerce was the Secretary of something else. I mean, there were typos in the book. It was just completely ridiculous. And you would think that Steve Bannon, who has a pretty interesting career behind him as, as a strategist, would have had a little more tact with this. Uh, that probably is the the biggest story out of the book, you know, not a uh, uh, Trump's <laughs> you know, meltdown of you know uh, he's he's just basically reacting uh, a, a, as he always does to criticism. But you know, I'd say that you know Bannon's meltdown has been the the, the big story out of this because uh, you know ba basically you know obviously you know he's upset about you know lo losing his job as chief strategist. He you know feels that you know he put in naturally. You know, his his soul into you know that uh, that presidency and so right. he's he's really cooperated uh, with this book as you know uh, as sort of a a way to you know air his frustrations which airing it publicly like this is is not a a, a good way to go and and it's uh, as we've seen it's made because uh, he as soon as he uh, left uh, the White House he went straight back into uh, his role as executive chairman at at Breitbart and declared that the Trump presidency right. uh, uh, what, uh, was dead, and basically to you know yeah. take that you know your, uh, that attitude you know to an organization like Breitbart. The reason why Breitbart became you know so popular is because it was you know the the news organization that was you know on the the Trump train Trump. Uh, first, and you know uh, yeah. helped you know propel his presidential run to to the White House. So. You know, Bannon going back there, right. and you know, and, and he left at the same time as you know, writes Priebus, and I, I'm sure that you know, Priebus was right. probably just as pissed at you know, getting uh, ousted, but you know, because Priebus right. has been in, you know, uh, you know, 
the, the political machine for, for so many years, he knows that, you know, you should just say nice things in public, even if you are, you know, seething exactly. uh, behind the scenes. And it seems that Bannon, he, you know, because he's, this was his first political gig, he, he's, he's, he's basically, right. he, he's ruined, uh, like, he's not just ruined any future in a uh, political campaign for himself, he's now, uh, you know, resigned right. from Breitbart because, you know, the people at Breitbart say, hey, you can't be, you know, r uh, rubbishing, you know, the, the person, the person who, you know, has gained us the, the most traffic to our website. Essentially, yeah. So I have a little bit of a different take on uh, Bannon. I think, obviously, he was ousted. I think he was trying to make the Trump presidency about himself. And Trump being, you know, <laughs> obviously, uh, very into himself and to his ego, uh, obviously, and uh, obviously, uh, more reasons, but it seems like that was the primary reason that he started kind of started getting pushed out. Uh, that in the conflict with his family. And so I think what Bannon was trying to do more than just kind of, you know, tell Trump to, you know, F off, is more try to bring himself into some political relevance outside of Trump while still having some attachment to Trump. So saying Donald Trump's presidency is dead, I, I'm the one that made it what it is, and now I'm that Trump figure. Like, I'm the Trump train. And I think that what he was trying to do is basically belittle Trump and make himself look better uh, and obviously what happened was just a catastrophic fail. On the other hand, you know, this is a guy who was, I mean, everything that we know, for example, now about the Clintons, all of the issues that had to do with, you know, um, Bill Clinton's corruption and Hillary Clinton accepting money and uh, all, all, these, all these kind of like uh, uh, huge stories about the Clintons, those came from Breitbart, but not directly. Uh, Steve Bannon has a, an organization, I'm not sure if it's still around, but it was called the Center for Government Accountability. And what they would do is essentially create these, uh, these sort of stories that seem legitimate. They basically kind of put doubts in the mind of uh, different news organizations and then had the news organizations pick it up. So for, for, for Steve Bannon, he knew that the mainstream media machine was the only way to gain some legitimacy. He knew that if he grabbed all the things that he you know, invented about the Clintons and put it on Breitbart, no one would turn, a, turn an eye. But once he did it through his organization and had uh, mainstream media asking the questions about whether or not the Clintons murdered somebody, whether or not they were accepting illicit payments, then that's when it became relevant. And so it's so curious to see this guy who you would think is such a savvy political thinker, such a strategist, all these things would point to this guy being an absolute genius, then turning around and making a rookie mistake. I, I, I don't even know how to how to explain it. I don't think it's petty. I think it's stupid. Yeah, and uh, like I was saying before, it's you know he hasn't made the the transition you know post uh, you know leaving uh, political office to you know pro probably uh, uh, the people at Breitbart they also you know made an error in you know taking him you know back on uh, you know uh, so quickly given that you know he he did you know have you know, obviously, you know, was quite burnt out by his, you know, t a time in the in the White House, and it's right. it's also worth reflecting on, you know, what is the future for, you know, Breitbart, because, um, you know, at the at the beginning of this uh, this year, you know, they were, you know, at the the top of their game, and they still had, you know, obviously, Milo Yiannopoulos right. as their biggest personality. He's you know, no, oh. no, no longer there, right. and now they're sort of they're they're in a bit right. of a mess with, um, you know, what, uh, yeah. their take on the the Trump uh, presidency. Well, essentially, I think that uh, obviously, uh, uh, you know, Breitbart has been an institution for a while, never never to this scope, but I think that one of the things, especially about uh, Trump supporters, not not to categorize them broadly, but I think that they are very loyal to the opinions of Donald Trump. And Steve Bannon, who initially was a very beloved figure, now seems to be the person that everyone hates the most in the world and everyone calls him a crackhead and a lunatic and everything. So uh, yeah, I think that he basically, I mean, Breitbart, I think, I think it won't go away completely. But to say that it's going to have the scope or the relevance that it did in the past couple of years is, uh, is I think, understating it.
And in response, uh, Trump himself has gone, you know, viciously after uh, Bannon. He's uh, 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 given Bannon one of his uh, famous nicknames, calling him uh, Sloppy Steve and, you know, claimed that he cried uh, when he got fired. And of course, you know, when when Trump goes, you know, after, you know, somebody, whether they're, you know, a uh, left liberal or even, you know, somebody on the Republican side, you know, that's, uh, that, that signifies, you know, the, the end of their credibility amongst Trump supporters. Absolutely. And also, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that once Trump labels you, it's almost certainly going to stick. So, I mean, I think Steve Bannon, who has, you know, been working himself up to be this, you know, great figure has now turned into sloppy Steve, which is unfortunate for him. Whether he cried or not, I, I would doubt it. You know, he seems like a pretty put together guy. But I mean, the fact of the matter is, in uh, Trump supporters mind, Trump's word is the final word. And if they say, if he said rather that he cried, and that he is an idiot and that he lost his mind, then to his base, to the people that would listen to him at some point, he is just completely, completely, uh, you know, off the radar, irrelevant and a crybaby now and sloppy. And I think it's foolish of Bannon to think that, you know, he could, you know, be uh, a Trump-like figure because, you know, nobody can, you know, out-Trump Trump. And, you know, Bannon's always been, like, yes, he's, yeah. you know, spoken in public before, but, you know, he, he's never, you know, had the personality, you know, of, you know, Trump. He's, you know, everyone knows who he is, but, you know, he's just been seen, you know, uh, 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 behind the scenes and, uh, you know, obviously, you know, Breitbart, it's a... Um, um, you know, uh, written a uh, news site. It um, it doesn't do much uh, right. broadcasting itself, and so you know the the fact that right. you know Bannon thought that you know he could you know supplant Trump, you know just from just be, uh, just from being in the you know background of you know Breitbart and the the White House. I yeah. think you know that uh, that's ludicrous. It's ludicrous. It makes no sense. Uh, I mean. Also, I mean, we're, we're kind of better off without Breitbart. I mean, uh, I, I think I, I'm, I'm always skeptical to scream fake news because, you know, uh, on both sides, fake news is just so, uh, it's just so blown up. You know, anything that anyone doesn't like, whether you're a liberal, whether you're a lefty or a conservative, it's basically, you know, if they say something I don't like, that's fake news. But Breitbart was actually, for the most part, fake news. It was, it was kind of up there with Alex Jones, in my opinion. They uh, always put out extremely, extremely inaccurate or completely fake stories. And uh, I think we're better off without them. Wh whether, you know, if you're a Trump supporter and you believe that they were paramount to Trump's success and you think that that's a good thing, that's fine. But honestly, I think that we need less of that fake and uh, deceiving content out on the web. Uh, it's, you know, I, like, during its prime, I still enjoy, you know, Breitbart, and it was a, it was a great source of, you know, uh, research to me when I was, because they did cover, you know, what was going on with the, um, you know, migrant crisis in, in Europe, and they, you know, were responsible for, you know, digging a lot of, you know, this stuff, right. um, out about the Clintons, they, um, promoted, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Juanita Broderick, you know, retelling, you know, her story. So I do think that they, you know, played uh, yeah. an important role. But, you know, in this, um, you know, I internet era, like the, um, as soon as people, you know, don't find you relevant anymore, the, the, the downfall is, is brutal. And yeah, I've, I have to say, yeah. I don't uh, view, you know, Breitbart, you know, much anymore, but it's, it's funny. I remember, oh. um, was it as about what it would have been eight years ago now, you know, Glenn Beck was the, you know, biggest, mm. you know, conservative personality. And, you know, he, he is pretty much, right. you know, uh, not not really anyone anymore and and so yeah it's uh, yeah. Uh, it's a you know fast moving game like not just you know for the political class but also for the media class right uh i mean absolutely look at milo yiannopoulos you know these uh i think people started getting really outraged about milo yiannopoulos right after trump became president uh and culture definitely uh, expanded her success based on Trump. I mean, a lot of people definitely, you know, kind of attach themselves to the to the sensationalism of Trump to kind of build their brand. Uh, but I mean, to say that Trump has has knocked some people down, I think, is an understatement. Also.
Uh, so we've talked about uh, the, the Trump side of uh, US uh, political news. Now let's talk about the, uh, what do we call them, the, you know, the left uh, liberal side, because uh, they, uh, they were busy oh, uh, yeah. patting themselves uh, on the back this week at the, the Golden Globe Awards, where all the yeah. women uh, wore uh, black to show solidarity with the, the, the Me Too movement, which uh, <laughs> it was just, you know, disgusting. Like, you know, they, you know, Hollywood, they're trying to preach to the rest of us about, you know, sexual harassment, you know, when they've been the biggest perpetrators of it. And, you know, that really Absolutely. irritates me big time. The fact that, you know, people, you know, because, you know, they've, um, you know, done the done the wrong thing, they say, oh, I, uh, I now want to, you know, f uh, put the blame on the, the rest of society and, and preach to you. It's like, no, this is, you know, your problem. You yeah. deal with it. Leave us out of it. Absolutely. I mean, you see all the people, obviously not all the people at the Golden Globe, there are some smaller stars, but the most powerful people who were the most self-aggrandizing, you know, uh, you know, just self-congratulatory pieces of garbage there, they are so rich, so powerful that they could have done something about this earlier and not had it destroy their career. I mean, you have, obviously, you know, as a new person in Hollywood, you kind of have to deal with whatever is the status quo, you have to deal with the casting couch or having some director come over and pat you on the ass or whatever. But as a very, you know, wealthy, illustrious member of that, uh, you know, small group of people, they could have stepped in. It was a badly kept secret. Everyone knew. Even people outside of Hollywood knew. And now, after, you know, they've been forced into this position, now they're all of a sudden the end-all solution. They're the messiah. They're the people that are going to end everything. I thought it was a, a disgusting display of hypocrisy on behalf of so many of them. And uh, I don't know if you heard about this. With a, this, this brought me great joy. But uh, Lena Dunham wasn't invited, uh, which you know is probably good. She wouldn't have been able to find a dress to fit her. But she wasn't invited, and so she did her own like side uh, black dress thing, which was uh, you know kind of disturbing. But because you know she's just disturbing in any in any capacity. But she actually allegedly also shamed this, uh, this writer on her show, Girls, into not reporting sexual harassment on behalf of one of the producers. She called her a liar. She said, don't do anything about it. This is against our business model. So it just goes to show that you know, these people in Hollywood, they're trying to preach to us, and they're the worst perpetrators of all of this. And I think people are catching on. And by the way, if anybody wanted to listen to celebrities political opinion, Hillary Clinton would be president. Every major celebrity endorsed her. I think Kid Rock and James Woods endorsed Donald Trump. And so clearly we have no interest in that. And it's easy to, you know, get all, you know, high and mighty and, you know, virtue signal after you know, so, uh, something like this has been exposed. But it's another thing to, you know, be a, a whistleblower and, you know, put basically your career on, on the line for it. You know, where were you, uh, you know, five, uh, five years ago when you knew this was happening, but, you know, you chose to, you know, to, uh, turn a blind eye because, you know, you didn't want to, you know, upset, um, you know, too, too many of your friends. Oh, I mean, absolutely. You see the amount of people who are now just, you know, so outraged about this whole thing that happened with sexual harassment. And they were praising Harvey Weinstein left and right. I mean, Harvey Weinstein was, you know, their, their messiah. He was just someone of so much respect. And I mean, to say that Harvey Weinstein being a badly kept secret was, you know, also an understatement because everybody knew. And you even saw saw jokes about it on on TV, you saw it on 30 Rock, you saw it uh, even in other Golden Globes uh, things. I think Sam McFarlane made a joke about it. So clearly they were pushed into this position. And now they're trying to say, no, we don't like this. We're the wonderful, you know, glorious, uh, you know, keepers of the truth. And let us tell you what you're doing wrong, society, even though we're the ones that are perpetrating this. By the way, Ben Affleck apparently has been hit with a bunch of these uh, uh, allegations. And those are being swept under the rug. And I think it's pretty convenient right now that Hollywood is set to make, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars off of his image as Batman that, you know, we can pay attention to everyone. We can throw anyone under the bus, including Bill Clinton. But when he is going to make us money or when he's politically uh, or someone's politically relevant to us, then, you know, let's let's protect them.
Uh, and of course, the the big you know, talking point out of the Golden Globes, apart from the the black dresses, was of course oh. uh, Oprah. She was accepting uh, some lifetime achievement award. I can't remember the exact uh, name right. of it. Uh, but she, you know, to, uh, she, uh, she gave this, you know, uh, because she's, you know, a good, you know, orator, you know, telling and inspiring story. So she, you know, talked about, yeah. uh, you know, witnessing the first, you know, black actor to, to win an Oscar when she was a little girl. And then, you know, she went right. into, you know, talking about the, you know, empowerment of the, the Me Too movement. And, if, and uh, the, uh, after that, there was uh, the the biggest story was oh you know could Oprah uh, be the the next president uh, and there was talk that you know she could you know seek the the Democratic nomination in in twenty twenty and uh, take on Trump. I mean that uh, I released an article about this actually a couple of days ago and it is you know the mainstream media has adopted a candidate who is not even a candidate and who has no platform. And their basis that she is going to run for president is that she made a speech, which she's Oprah. She won an award. What did you expect? So, I mean, that, that, that's pretty ridiculous, first of all. I, th I think that this speculation has been just so far away. And obviously, everyone had wonderful things to say about her, you know, on CNN and NBC and everyone. You know, it was just like this wonderful parade of Oprah and what a wonderful president she would be. What did she propose? She made a good speech. What she said was great and was very inspiring. And you know, a lot of what she said is true. And she's a, she's an incredibly inspiring woman. Also, you know, she she was born into a you know poor black family in an extremely poor part of the United States, and she worked herself to the most rich to the richest woman in media. But to say that you know we have no idea about her platform, we have no idea about how she'd handle herself as a candidate or the baggage that she has that that would come out once she is a candidate. But now we're asking ourselves if she can beat Trump. I think we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. And she actually reminds me of a like female version of Obama because you know Obama was good about you know giving the you know uh, inspiring speeches you know the audacity of hope you know yes yes we can uh, that that was what got him to the White right. House but you know as we saw you know there was you know a lot of uh, you know failures you know in him his, his, his uh, administration and you know. But, but at least Obama, you know, he, you know, he was a, you know, hardcore, you know, progressive with, you know, Oprah, you know, she, she hasn't, you know, espoused, you know, what does she believe on, you know, like, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, foreign policy, you know, the, the, the constitution. And it's, and it's interesting, she, she's not, she wouldn't be accepted by the, you know, progressive uh, base as easily as uh, a lot of people are talking about. There, there was some chatter on social media that uh, Oprah, you know, she's a, she's an evil capitalist. You know, she's, you know, uh, because you know she's uh, so, so wealthy. Uh, so, you know, she, I, I don't, uh, I don't think she'd be, uh, you know, quite as accepted. Uh, it depends. I mean, yeah, she might not be. She might be. You know, this is this isn't what she actually. I mean, one of the things that they're speculating about is whether she has a chance. She actually does. You know, she's very well liked across all spectrums. You know, I think that, you know, a lefty in California and a conservative in Texas, you know, two women will sit down and they will watch Oprah and they will like her. Uh, but I don't know if that, if it's so much a, a matter of money, I think it's, it might be a matter of her history. Uh, first, she hasn't been a very political figure, but there are two things that will weigh her down early on. The first is that she was like this with Harvey Weinstein. I mean, you see the amount of, of pictures of her and Harvey Weinstein together and her just being so happy with, you know, this molester that, I mean, it's, it's obviously going to be a huge question mark. And, you know, it was a badly kept secret. Oprah's a power player. She must have known, right? And on the other hand, you also have this thing that happened in her school in South Africa where there was, um, there was allegedly a, a couple of girls or I think maybe just one girl was sexually harassed by one of the employees. And you know she she kind of left that behind. She did everything that she had to do. She co cooperated with police. She uh she you know she she was very repentant about it. But we really you know since she was a celebrity and not a political figure, we kind of just like accepted it. We don't really know what happened. How was it that this school that she started in South Africa got to the point where uh, you have staff molesting students? We we really don't know what happened yet. Uh, and the speculation into that, whether it was completely benign and she had no idea, or whether she was just uh, doing something uh, nefarious, we can't know. But to say that she won't have any luggage and to just breeze through the nomination into the White House, 
is, is yet to be seen. And by the way, who even knows if we'll like her platform? We have no idea what the hell her platform is. She's apolitical. So how in the world would we know if she will make a good candidate? As as soon as there, there was that speculation in the media, uh, I saw, you know, all in my Facebook feed, all the, you know, photos of, you know, her with, you know, Weinstein, you know, they're, they're one right. thing the the internet is good at is, you know, digging up, you know, uh, uh, especially, you know, celebrities past, if they decide to, you know, virtue signal Absolutely. On, a, on a social issue there. Um, you know, I, I've, I remember after Meryl Streep, you know, made her, you know, anti-Trump speech, ah. there was, uh, uh, you know, people, people dug up that footage of her giving a standing ovation to um to trump uh, uh, no to uh, uh roman polanski and it was interesting that oh. Street was one of the the first um celebrities to endorse uh, oh. oprah for president and uh, she uh, she uh, you talked about uh weinstein being a messiah uh meryl streep uh, yeah. uh, called him god so um yeah i i mean i think i, I find meryl streep just as irritating as you can find a human being uh, I mean, uh, not, nothing to do with her acting or anything. I think just her as a, as, as a human being is just abhorrent. But, yeah, I mean, th- th- this whole political speculation on the left, I think it has gone far away from what is going to make the country better, what do we need, and it's gone to let's get rid of Trump. I will say, I'm, not, I'm no fan. I, I don't think it's ever good for a country to impeach a president. If he left, I wouldn't le- lose any sleep over it. But this idea that I'm going to attach myself to someone just because she may beat Donald Trump, I think is uh, completely absurd. I mean, uh, even, for example, people were saying, oh, well, you should either run Biden or Bernie Sanders next year, right? Uh, I mean, next year, in 2020. Uh, Biden is Obama. We didn't do too well. Uh, Sanders is essentially Donald Trump, except a little bit more on the left, but a lot of the financial decisions he would make are essentially the same. So I think the left has just found out that they dislike Donald Trump. They hate him beyond hate. And so now let's not focus on making our country better. Let's get rid of Donald Trump. Let's make sure he goes to jail. Let's send him to Guantanamo Bay. Then we can focus on everything else. It's kind of a dangerous path we're on. Uh, and we don't know how Oprah would approach, you know, going to head to head with Trump because, you know, they have been, you know, friendly uh, over the years. I mean, uh, Trump was a regular guest on her show, and it was interesting that so when she... uh, Trump was asked about it, you know, he wouldn't, he didn't say anything bad about Oprah. He just said it would be a a good contest. So. And, and uh, I, Oprah, she, does, she, she, I don't think she'd go down the, the Hillary Clinton road of, you know, saying that, you mm. know, Trump's a, you know, a misogynist and, you know, he is, you know, a horrible bigot. Uh, you know, I just, right. I just don't feel she'd do that. She'd be more, more of the Obama school, you know, get, uh, having the, the, the positive uh, message. And it'll be interesting, you know, how, um, yeah, how, how, you know, Trump would, like, would he, uh, in the end, you know, go after her, like, come up with a, um, you know, funny nickname for her? Yeah, Goofy Oprah or something. Uh, I don't know. I mean, well, I mean, uh, things can get pretty vitriolic pretty fast uh, when it comes to presidential races. Uh, obviously, you know, right now, Donald Trump didn't insult Oprah because I think, you know, he also wouldn't insult Beyonce, you know. <laughs> These are extremely popular people. You know, you really don't want to get on anyone's bad side in that sense. You know, you can attack Elizabeth Warren. Some people like her, some people don't. You know, she, generally, you'll probably, it'll probably come out of this uh, pretty unharmed. But to offend Oprah, I, I don't think that that would, <laughs> that would have been a very good political move for him. Uh, but when it comes to her and what Oprah would do uh, going head-to-head with Trump, what else would she campaign on? How, how else would she fight against Trump? I mean, one of the biggest tools that the left has right now, that the, the Democrats have right now towards Trump is the misogyny, is the, you know, the inefficiency, all these things. So if Oprah isn't willing to attack, then what's her platform? How is she expecting to win? I don't think that that would be a good path to success. And also, I think we're, we're also getting really ahead of ourselves. Who knows if she's even actually thinking of running? Who knows if, uh, you know, what will happen in 2020? Who knows if any of the candidates we have, you know, we might end up with President Mark Zuckerberg. Who the hell Oh, is? God. Uh, yeah. the First Amendment, if that happens. Oh, my God, that would be bad. Especially, that's what they're saying. Don't you find it creepy that the person that knows everything about everyone is going to go out and try to win everyone's heart? Uh, uh, yeah, for herself, she you know said she's you know not interested in it at the moment. Like uh, she's right. she obviously you know 
she, she people have been speculating whether she you know would have anticipated you know having this speculation by you know making uh such a speech uh, it's probably not in her right. um you know mind at the moment but uh it was interesting a friend uh, uh gail king said that you know she could probably be talked into it that she's probably you know open to it it's not something she wants to do it do at this stage but yeah. you know if there if there was enough sort of if she got enough you know taps on the the, so, uh, the shoulder and you know there was right. you know a lot of donors saying you know he has lots of money to uh to run yeah. uh you know she she wouldn't be the person to say i mean because yeah, she she's done her talk show now. Um, you know that ended you know a number of years ago. Now she's sort right. of done everything that she you know needs to you know uh, yeah. do uh, do in life. She's um, right. you know obviously you know the for for somebody like her the the next logical progression would be uh, you know politics. <laughs> I mean, right. that, we we've seen that in Australia with you know Malcolm Turnbull. Like you know if he'd mm. he'd made enough money in you know uh, business and uh, banking that he decided to to enter into politics. Yeah, he's like, why the hell not? Mm. Uh, I mean, I think so. Uh, but I mean, going forward, you know, the the Republicans are less comfy than they were definitely at the beginning of the year. You have Oprah Winfrey possibly could be Donald Trump. I mean, it's not a stretch of the imagination. She's well-liked. She's apolitical, so she may not have a lot of baggage. And, uh, you know, she's she's a, a pretty inspiring figure. So she could. And also, right now, polling shows that uh, what what's uh, Obama's vice president? Uh, Biden and Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren right now are polling higher among likely voters. And right now they've gone from a 53 majority to a 51 majority. Right now, really, Republicans have to um, have to see what they what the hell they're going to do, because whether it's Oprah Winfrey or Mark Zuckerberg or uh, Bernie Sanders or whoever, it seems like they can take on Donald Trump directly and actually get him out. Who it'll be, I guess we'll have to wait and see. There, there's one person that already made it through the primaries and is still well liked, who's Bernie Sanders. If he'll make it to 2020. Even with a heartbeat, yeah, I'm not sure. That, that, that's the thing about uh, Sanders and Biden. They're both, you know, really old, like in their mid to late seventies now. Yeah. Um, well, it just goes to show the sort of lack of uh, talent in the Democratic Party that they, you know, they're no kidding. They don't have, you know, a rich field to choose from. Uh, you know, somebody who they think they can beat, who can beat Trump. Yeah, essentially. Although, I mean, I, I guess they got very cozy. It seemed like, you know, Obama was going to be, you know, the first president of the Democratic States of America. You know, he was just going to be, he was going to set this, the, the standard and no Republican was going to get in again. And then after Trump, who seemed like the easiest candidate to beat ever, he probably was. I mean, just Hillary Clinton is so awful. Uh, you know, it seemed like, you know, they, I think they got too cozy. They didn't have to kind of look at themselves and say, what do we have to adjust? And so they have no youthful political figures, you know? I mean, to think that Elizabeth Warren is like the, the young people's uh, beacon of hope just goes to show you how, what, a, what a lack of um, youthfulness and uh, novelty we have within the party. Well, we, I don't know why I'm saying we, but they have within the party. Uh, but I guess on the other hand, you know, between now and 2020, you know, a seven billion things are gonna happen. I think there's one, uh, there's one congressman, he's this young black guy, um, I forget his name. He he apparently wants to run. I think I think there's a, a Kennedy right now, young, uh, you know, red hair. He he seems to be very vivacious. He's also uh, planning on running. So I think that I think that maybe we they they can uh, you know get together a few candidates that could definitely take on Trump in a much more youthful way. Uh, as you said, you know, anything you know could happen in, or uh, definitely in the next three years, even uh, this right. year. I mean, everyone was saying, you know, six, week. Week, six, six, six weeks out from you know the twenty sixteen election that you know Trump was finished after the um, you know the the bus uh, tape. Yeah, uh, yeah. So anyone who you know tries to predict uh, you know what's going to happen or that believes you know Trump is finished is uh, a fool. Oh God. Yeah, so we'll certainly look forward to more of your reports. Uh, Emilio. Absolutely. Uh, stay safe in uh, Mexico and yeah, um, we Absolutely. look forward to uh, having you back uh, in Australia in uh, a couple of months time. Absolutely. Also for everyone, uh, remember that on February 1st, the second season of Front and Center is coming out. So stay tuned for that. 
And uh, just to say my goodbye, I think Tim, right before the interview started, said that it looks like I have makeup on. I just want to make sure that everyone knows, all of your viewers know, that I don't. It's just uh, uh, an image. It's kind of like an effect from the webcam. Uh, you're not going uh, gender fluid. I don't think that'll happen anytime soon. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Now, we didn't comment on Donald Trump's uh, shithole countries remark as it broke after we recorded this podcast, but don't worry, we will still have uh, plenty to say on this story, both on the Unshackled and on our next show, as this story will still run for a number of days. I'd like to remind you all once again to vote in the 2017 Unshackler Awards. There are 10 awards with uh, 10 nominees in each category, with winners determined by a poll of our followers and announced on Australia Day. Uh, the new categories that have been posted is the Unshackler of the Year and also the International Cuck of the Year, so make sure you get voting. Our friend Dave Palau from Church and State is holding his first major event, the Church and State Summit 2018, on the 23rd to 24th of February in Brisbane, which will feature many high-profile speakers, including Margaret Court and Deputy Prime Minister John Anderson, and we'll leave links to uh, how you can uh, get tickets in the description and show notes page. Thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.